What's up, everybody? This is Trey Biddy with hogsports.com. That's H-A-W-G sports.com. Today, we're going to talk Razorback football, basketball, baseball. As always, we're going to answer your questions. We're going to project a little bit to 2019, the Razorback football season, the NFL draft for 2019. We're going to look back at this past weekend, everything that happened as well. And we're going to talk a little bit about Game of Thrones. I know some people want to talk about that. Certainly an exciting episode last night. It's all happening on Hog Sports Live. All right, before we get started here, I want to encourage everybody to go ahead and get your questions submitted here. Uh, I'll be taking questions throughout the show, and we're going to hold the Game of Thrones discussion for the end. I don't want to have any spoiler stuff, so don't worry if you haven't watched the show already. We're not going to spoil it for you. I'll make sure to talk about that towards the end. Um, But let's jump right into it. Uh, First thing on the docket here, the week that was, Arkansas wrapping up a three-game series with Tennessee, uh, a 4-3 win on Saturday to uh, to sweep uh, the series. And looking next week, they got a game Tuesday against Grambling uh, in Dickey Stevens Park in North Little Rock. So uh, that's the last midweek game, I guess. And then they got Kentucky, a three-game series uh, in Lexington starting Friday. So uh, baseball team, things going well there. Got a lot of stuff on hogsports.com if you haven't been on there. And uh, again, before we really get going into this thing, I want to remind you to go ahead and like, share, follow, comment on the video if you like what we're doing here at hogsports.com. There's a lot of ways to listen. Uh, you can you can go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. You can watch on Facebook Live and, of course, YouTube, and the video is always going to be on hogsports.com. Right now at hogsports.com, you can sign up for just a dollar or you can sign up for a year and get a seven-day free trial and take 30% off your subscription. So uh, a lot of content at hogsports.com right now. If you're listening on podcasts, I want to go ahead and remind you to throw us five stars and rate the show as well. Like I said, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher are the options there for you. Uh, So let's get back into it here. The week ahead, I mentioned that, that they're playing Kentucky. Uh, let's look back at the at the last week. Three former Razorbacks were selected in the NFL draft, uh, starting with Yelda Froholt in the third round, number 118 overall to the New England Patriots. I think that's a great spot for him. No doubt probably influenced a little bit by Brett Bielema and his connections to the New, New England Patriots. But Froholt's a guy that I think can make it in the NFL and certainly landed at a great spot with a great program in the New England Patriots. Number 148, linebacker Drake. Greenlaw to the San Francisco 49ers in the fourth round. Uh, Another good spot for Dre Greenlaw. I think that Greenlaw is a guy that fits in kind of the new look of an outside linebacker uh, in some of these defenses, a hybrid safety. We've talked about that a little bit. Greenlaw just so I've seen him outrun cornerbacks on Arkansas, and you may be saying that's, that doesn't say a whole lot, but I've seen him outrun cornerbacks at Arkansas. I think that uh, I think that he's got a future at the next level, not in, exceedingly big, but you know, ten years ago we would have looked at that position, we would have looked at Greenlaw, and we'd have called him. Ah, he's a, he's kind of a tweener, but really there's a great spot for him now in the NFL. Uh, and then Armand Watts, who came on last season. A guy that had basically disappeared and had a really strong season, was one of the top defensive tackles in terms of sacks in the country uh, and in the SEC, but going number 190 overall to the Minnesota Vikings. Ryan Pulley not drafted. It's always disappointing, I think, when you see a guy that declares early and has a year of eligibility left. Now, he was a fourth-year junior last year, so hopefully he's got things in order school-wise, but... um, you know, all, there was like five guys, I think, that signed with uh, with free agents uh, as free agents, and he was one of them. So I think that Pulley has a chance to make an NFL roster. Some people may disagree with me, but I just think that he's got – I just think he's got the ability to do it. Um, and, and you may disagree with me. You can leave your comments there. But no, regardless, it was a mistake for him to go pro early. You know, now you have to pay for your school if you haven't graduated. And I don't believe he has. Uh, it was a mistake – to go pro early. There were 140-something players that decided to go early, and 40 of them I don't think were drafted. It's a mistake. People look ahead. People don't look ahead, I should say. People are are a little bit too short-sighted. I don't mean to come down on Pulley because I like Pulley, but people are a little bit too short-sighted, and they see now, 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 and they're so much ahead. And it's easy for me to say it at 41 years old when we're talking about, you know, guys that are 22, but um, – I don't know. I just I, I feel like people are in such a hurry. And if you ask most people, when's the best time in your life? If it's if it's not college, college is tied with something. You know, uh, 
Lael La- 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 Collins, I believe his name, a couple of years ago at LSU. He was an offensive lineman who was going to be a high draft pick and decided to return for his senior year. And I thought he said it best because, you know, this is a time that I'll never get back. You'll never get college back. So, uh, anyway, some guys leaving early. I want to go over some players real quick here for next year to keep an eye on uh, in the NFL draft. Let's go first with Scooter Harris. Scooter, I think, is going to be drafted next year. Uh, now, he was out with the spring uh, with, a, with a foot injury, but he's going to be back full go. He's been healthy throughout most of his career, has been in the top three in, in tackles at Arkansas uh, in the SEC for the last two seasons, and will probably do that again next year if he stays healthy. But Dijon Harris, a guy that fits well at middle linebacker. I'm not saying he's Devin White, but he's kind of in the same size category is Devin White, not exceedingly tall at about six foot legit, uh, but a guy that's got really great instincts. The leader of this team, uh, I think there's all kinds of things like that that'll work in his favor. So Scooter Harris is who I've got uh, definitely going. C.J. O'Grady, as long as he keeps it clean, we talked a lot about O'Grady last week, but I think O'Grady also has a ton of ability and is a guy that had 400 catch, 400 receiving yards last year and I think can have 800 this year. But C.J. O'Grady, definitely a guy to keep an eye on next year for the NFL draft and to have a big season for the Razorbacks as well. Uh, this one might, might leave a little bit of head scratching, but Rakeem Boyd, you know, he's just going to be a junior next year. But if his shoulder comes back fully healthy, if he if he stays healthy all year, this is a guy that averaged six yards a carry last season, over 700 yards, almost 800 yards a year ago, and really got off to a late start. I mean, he started the season at 200 pounds, and, and a couple months in was 215 pounds. Uh, so he'll come in in better shape and healthier, hopefully. I mean, he that, that injury dates back to his days in, in junior college. And he's a guy that has home run hitting ability. I think a guy that could possibly take things to the next level for Arkansas at running back. And you see running backs declare early all the time. I think he would be a guy to watch in that regard. McTelvin Aguim, I think Sosa is going to have a breakout year this year. I've been expecting it for a while. And he's been good. He just hasn't been great. He hasn't been five-star great. So McTelvin Aguim is another guy that I think has a strong possibility. Four and a half sacks last year. Uh, A guy that – can be a leader up front for Arkansas. A defensive line that's going to have four starters, four senior starters. Now, I kind of like to go – let's let's see what I've got here. I've got a breakdown of all the guys that uh, – where is it? Okay, so here's a story that I, I put out this morning. Can Arkansas get back to a bowl game in 2019? And I look at a few games. So, first of all, the non-conference games. Portland State, Colorado State, San Jose State, and Western Kentucky, even though they're going to be led by, uh, by Ty Story, ironically. Uh, but Arkansas should go 4-0 in those games this year. Usually you make your biggest leap and improvement year one to year two, whether you're a player, whether you're a program, any of that stuff. So I would expect Arkansas to make a big leap. Obviously they're going to want to win every game, but really – if you look at it, at it from an outsider standpoint, you're just like, make a big leap forward, get to a bowl game. So you win those four non-conference games. They absolutely should win. There's no excuse for them not winning any of those games. Even Colorado State, who beat them last year, uh, there's no excuse for them losing those four games. So win those four non-conference games. They get them all in Fayetteville. Um, and then you got to get a couple of games in the SEC. So who to look at in the SEC? Let's start with Missouri, the last game of the season. Now, it's maybe weird to say that they could possibly beat a team that whipped them 38 nothing, but I, I think Arkansas just kind of let go of the rope last season. They didn't have anything to play for. Uh, Missouri has lost Drew Locke, who at one point was regarded as the number one quarterback prospect in the draft. So they lost uh, Drew Locke, who slipped to the second round to, to my Broncos, uh, but they replaced him with Kelly Bryant. So they have a good plan in place with Drew Locke. Um, but I still think Arkansas has got a chance to get them in Fayetteville next year, even though they lost 38 nothing. I'm not guaranteeing it or anything, but I'm just saying that's one team to look at. But really, I wanted to focus on three other teams. Kentucky, number one. All right, so Arkansas travels to Kentucky for the first time in 11 years, I think, since 2008, playing for the first time in seven years. Uh, they lost some some key players. Now, they get Terry Wilson back at quarterback, but – uh, they lost Josh Allen, their outstanding outside linebacker, number seven overall pick to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, they lost Lonnie Johnson, a cornerback, uh, to the Houston Texans. Lost him in the second round. So a first and second rounder, uh, a third rounder, and Mike Edwards, a defensive back to Tampa Bay Buccaneers. 
the heart and soul of their team in Benny Snell, number 122 overall. Now, like I said, Mark Stoops has done a good job recruiting. He has used his inroads into Ohio and really pulls out a lot of good players out of there. So he's built this thing the right way, but that's a lot to lose. You know, you're not going to just – there's not another Josh Allen or a Benny Snell on this team. So uh, I think those are, are definitely notable. And then um, they lost an offensive lineman late in the draft too in the seventh round. Mississippi State is another team that I think Arkansas could possibly get. Now, this is a team that beat Arkansas 52-6 to last year. But look what they lost. First of all, they lost Nick Fitzgerald, who wasn't drafted, but has been a thorn in Arkansas' side uh, the last three years, especially the last two. Uh, first round, Jeffrey Simmons, Mississippi State, defensive tackle to the Tennessee Titans, lost him, lost Montez Sweat, defensive end. Uh, to the Washington Redskins in the first round, and a defensive back, Jonathan Abram, to uh, the Oakland Raiders, number 27 overall. So three defensive players in the first round. And I know that uh, that they have put an emphasis on defensive recruiting, but they're not going to replace those guys. I mean, they, I'm not saying these teams have just stopped recruiting. They're in the SEC. They're getting good recruits, but that's a lot to lose right there. And then you lost your center, uh, number 44 overall, to the Green Bay Packers. You lost another defensive end, Jerry Green, to, uh, to the Indianapolis Colts uh, in the sixth round. So they lost a lot. They lost a lot, especially on the defensive side of the ball, and they lost their quarterback. So uh, that's a possibility. I mean, if you consider Arkansas. Now, I think the two teams that I just mentioned, Kentucky, Mississippi State, I think they got a little bit worse. I think they, I think Arkansas lost some good players, but did Arkansas get worse? Are they going to be better or worse next year? You know? Kentucky, are they going to win 10 games again? They haven't won 10 games since 1977 until last year. So odds are they're not. But, again, I'm not saying Arkansas is going to beat all these teams, but I think these are three teams to watch that were hit in the draft. The third team is Ole Miss. Three teams that were hit in the draft that uh, that Arkansas, I think, improves, and I think these teams take a little bit of a step back. Uh, Ole Miss lost Jordan Ta'amu. Uh, now, he wasn't drafted again, but, again, this is a guy that really has been – good against Arkansas the last couple of years, especially last season in Little Rock when they won by four points. Uh, but this is a series, the last four games were decided by one point, four point, one point, and four points, including the overtime game with the Hunter Heave. But so they lost Greg Little, offensive tackle, number 37 overall to Carolina, A.J. Brown, wide receiver to Tennessee, D.K. Metcalf to the Seattle Seahawks. These all happened in the second round, those three picks. And uh, so – I mean that's that's three that's two really good wide receivers, uh, and your your left tackle. They also lost Dawson Knox, a tight end, in the third round. Um, Javon Patterson, uh, offensive lineman, in the seventh, and Ken Webster, uh, defensive back, uh, to New England. So, are they going to be able to replace AJ Brown, DK Metcalf? Probably not. No, they, they've got a guy in line, Matt Quarrell, uh, who's a well-regarded recruited quarterback, but. Uh, this is week two. Arkansas has got a couple of veteran quarterbacks who are grad transfers, so there's going to be a working-in process. But I would think maybe less of a working-in process for them versus Matt Coral, um, who's uh, just a redshirt freshman for them. So those three teams, let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, if you think that Arkansas has got a chance to, to compete against those teams, how bad you think that they were hit in the NFL draft. Uh, let's see what else we got next on the docket. So let's take a look. Let's continue on with our look ahead to the week, or excuse me, or continue our week ahead look. Uh, so uh, real quick look back. We got to mention Corey Williams joining the staff at Arkansas. Uh, officially hired as Arkansas as an Arkansas assistant coach on Wednesday. Uh, has been at Stets in the past six six, six seasons. Not a very good record. Thirty point four percent winning percentage. Seven of twenty seven and twenty four last season. So not a very good record as a head coach. But the thing you have to remember is he was at Oral Roberts from 2000 to 2007, and he parlayed that into the Florida State job from 2007 to 2013 as an assistant. He got the Stetson job, which is a tough job. He got the Stetson job because he was so successful at Florida State as an assistant coach. Arkansas is bringing him in as an assistant coach. So you have to keep that in mind, you know. Um, so – Corey Williams joining the staff at Arkansas. We talked about the Diamond Hogs beating Tennessee um, and uh, and got Kentucky this week. Let's talk real quick about the other guys in the NFL draft. Ryan Wallace was signed to the Denver Broncos. Ryan Pulley to the Arizona Cardinals. Santos Ramirez to the New York Jets. Johnny Gibson to the Philadelphia Eagles. And Randy Ramsey to the Green Bay Packers. So that's uh, the remaining five guys who signed free agent contracts so far. 
uh, out of Arkansas. I think that pretty much covers it. We've got some official visitors coming up this weekend. Uh, Brandon Frazier's coming in on Thursday, tied in out in McKinney, Texas, North High School. 6'7", 231 pounds, a guy that we think is going to move up the rankings. He's a three-star currently, ranked the number 35 tied in in the country on the 24-7 sports composite. 24-7 sports individual ranking actually has him number 23 overall tied in, so a little bit higher on 24-7 on sports. Uh, Arkansas, we believe, is his leader right now. They're going to want to sign two tight ends in the class and possibly bring in a older – transfer player as well because if you consider they're just going to have grace and gunner and hudson henry in 2020 so numbers get a little thin at tight end so they're going to run and bring in at least two high school guys and probably a veteran guy so brandon frazier is definitely a guy to look at six seven two thirty one out of mckinney uh, Garrett Hayes, offensive lineman, a guy that we kind of think may be on commitment watch, a four-star, uh, ranked the number 112 overall prospect in the country on 24-7 sports, number 13 offensive tackle out of Athens, Texas. That would be a nice addition with Takias Crawford, who took an official visit, was an official or unofficial visit to, to LSU over the weekend. Uh, but we still think Arkansas is in good shape there. So Garrett Hayes would be a nice addition. Offensive line, obviously a big area of need moving forward. Jahari Rogers, cornerback out of Arlington, Texas. There was – somebody had Arkansas listed as his favorite. We don't quite think his – that Arkansas is his favorite, at least according to Danny West. But uh, he's another four-star uh, recruit, number 141 overall prospect in the country. Uh, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia Tech, LSU, Miami are some of the top schools for him. But Arkansas is getting that official visit. Uh, like Garrett Hayes, he's coming in Friday. And we had Ryan Watts on the list, but Ryan Watts has since committed to uh, Oklahoma. So uh, we don't think he'll be making that visit. But this is a guy that Arkansas got in on extremely early. And, of course, Oklahoma came in and, and stole him late there. So it uh, looks like three official visitors for the weekend moving forward. Um, we talked a little bit about baseball, Grambling State coming up on the schedule on Tuesday in North Little Rock. And then you got Kentucky and Lexington for a three-game series. Uh, Danny West has a nice article on Kyrie Walker. I'm not going to give away everything there. It's a VIP story, but he talks a little bit about the possibility of reclassifying and things like that. Danny actually has him listed as hot right now on the big red board for hoops, which we list the, the top prospects that Arkansas is off is after. Uh, but there's a nice little article about him talking about the schools that are interested and you know what he's looking for and what he thinks about moving ahead to the class of 2019, which is a possibility. Kyrie Walker, four-star, or excuse me, five-star, uh, number 19-ranked player in the country in the 2020 class. Um, and his, his teammate, Dale and Terry, also, who Arkansas has offered, who's a four-star. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Danny West got a night br nice breakdown about Arkansas shots in the postseason, breaks down the remaining baseball schedule and uh, the teams that are on the schedule. So uh, that's where we are right there. Um, we're going to wait on Game of Thrones just a minute. Let's see if we got any questions popping up here. Larry Vineyard says, fire Hunter Juracek. I don't know why you'd fire Hunter Juracek. I think, I mean, if you look at what Hunter's done so far, uh, he's made a basketball hire. Uh, I think that he's moving things in the right direction. I wish he would make some changes to the ticket scan number because we all know that's bogus, that they're not getting an accurate number on ticket scam, and people see that. Great week for the Hogs baseball, says Zach Hoggard. Zach Hoggard, that's a great name for a Razorback fan. Todd Drake, what have you heard is for assistant coaching possibilities for the basketball team? I mean, they're, they're really all over the map. Now, they did just hire a special assistant, uh, the Hayes guy, uh, who was with Musselman at Nevada, but – it's, it's difficult to tell. There's a lot of stuff going on out there. Has Musselman completed his staff yet, says Randy Clay? No. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that first name, Mr. Beagles. Doesn't seem to be much of sense of urgency to get a five position for this upcoming year. The ones mentioned aren't even going to visit. Yeah, I mean, it's there are three guys out there that are, you know, in the 6'10 range that Arkansas is after, um, but – I mean, Kadeem Sy has been the guy most mentioned, and it doesn't seem like there's just a great shot that they get him. Uh, but it could just be one of those years where they're a little bit, uh, a little bit, you know, thin down low. And and you've got some guys on the roster that can hopefully step up for you too. I mean, but yeah, it doesn't look like there's just a great answer right now. Todd Drake says, "What do you think about the hiring of the women's gymnastics coach at Arkansas?" I think it's interesting. She's 23 years old. She's an Olympic gold medalist. I think those are positive things. I don't know a whole lot about women's gymnastics, but, um, I mean, she seems to have a lot of credentials, be very young and, uh, and highly recommended coming out of UCLA. 
That was four SEC teams you talked about. I, I mentioned Missouri, but I was really kind of focusing, Stephen, on on the teams that lost a, a good bit to the NFL draft that may not be necessarily replaceable. And I know they lost Drew Locke, but they also have, um, you know, a quarterback situation pretty much figured out for next year. Luann Thompson's who's three guys you think Musselman can realistically get? Well, let's look at the board real quick. Where are we at? Big Red Hoops board. All right. Danny's got a new offer tracker. So Kyrie Walker we think is a, a real – possibility and Namari Burnett is another one a five-star that they've offered in 2020 I'm not saying these are realistic possibilities but what I like about Musselman is he's going after guys I mean Cade Cunningham's another five-star uh, Dalen Terry who's out of the same school as Kyrie Walker at Hillcrest Prep uh, four-star small forward Moses Moody uh, all these are 2020 guys uh, Chris Moore out of West Memphis would be a huge get. He's got a ton of ability. Jalen Williams out of Fort Smith Northside. Micah Peavy out of Duncanville, Texas. Woody Newton out of Baltimore, Maryland. These are all class of 2020 guys. Beagle says we need a big, a five, badly. I agree. I agree with that. All right, so we've gone about 21 minutes. Yeah, so this is your spoiler alert. We're going into Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. All right, so if you've if you haven't watched the episode tonight or you're thinking about getting to the series, first of all, if, you have, if you're not watching it, then you need to be watching it. It's, it's the greatest show on television, maybe the best show in, in several ages. So what happened last night, the final scene, Arya sneaking up behind the Night King and taking him out. I thought it was, I thought it was a great scene. First of all, can we talk about the women in this in this show? I mean, you talk about some strong female characters. I mean, it's you have Arya first of all. I mean, that goes without saying. And really, I think before I dive into all that, I just I, I don't want to I don't want to leave off what Arya did and what we've witnessed her do. You know, she went to the temple with the um, the faceless men and. Um, what's a girl's name and all that stuff. And that was all very confusing. And she just seemed like she was over there forever. And we're just like, why? I mean, let's, let's move this thing along, but it was all worth it. And you see what really over the last decade of her life on the timeline of game of Thrones was all building up to this particular scene. And I'm going to say this, you know, Melisandre, who was one of the, uh, one of the ones who died in the, uh, in the last episode, the red woman, when she, first met Arya and she says, I see darkness in, in you. And she says, you're going to shut many eyes. You're going to shut, um, she says, brown eyes, blue eyes, and green eyes. And that's the order she says it. When she was talking about it last night, she said brown eyes, green eyes, blue eyes in that order. But the order she initially said it was brown, blue, green. So brown eyes, Walter Frey, beady brown eyes, blue eyes, the Night King, green eyes, Cersei. So I think that that's all foreshadowing that she is going to take out. She's going to be the one that takes out Cersei. I've heard some criticism, some criticism of the, of the episode, which it blows me away. You know, people are criticizing the battle scene. What you have to understand about the battle scene is it didn't exactly go as expected. I mean, first you have the Dothraki going out there and just the lights going out. I thought that was, that was incredible, uh, basically wiping out all the Dothraki. And you have Danny who's watching that, and they're supposed to be holding back, right? But she sees that and she, you know, breaks the plan and then John joins her. So the whole plan of what they had decided to do was was thrown off. But they spent 55 days filming this. I mean, that is incredible. You know, in freezing temperatures, like below zero uh, sometimes. Uh, so I thought that was just incredible. The, the whole way that they filmed it, the whole way they set it up. Um, even though you know that the Night King, I mean, really, we knew the Night King's going down. We know this whole series can't end with the Night King winning. And if they're not taking him out, we know Cersei isn't taking him out. Um, so I thought that the way that, um, that they took it out in that episode, you had two, two episodes building up to it uh, where they're just basically getting the armies together, getting everybody reconciled, making you, you know, like kind of tugging at your, uh, you know, your heartstrings a little bit about everybody and, um, you know, just setting them up to just to rip your guts out when, when they're killed. Um, but man, I thought that, that the way that, that they took out the Night King, because it was really about 30 minutes when we last saw Arya to the end of the show, you know, it was about 30 minute gap before we saw, um, Arya again. And you almost, you almost forgot that she was, 
had left and that she said, you know, what do we say to the God of death? Not today. And then uh, there she shows up and takes out the Night King with that, that move that we actually saw last, I guess last season um, uh, when she's uh, fighting Bren of Tar, when they're, when they're just sparring and she, she switches the blade to the other hand. Uh, and that blade is brought up throughout the series. Just show uh, people are like saying that like it's it's not well written and there's holes and stuff. It's tremendously well written. I don't I don't know what people are expecting. I thought one of the funnest things to do after the show was watch the Twitter reactions. I mean, the people recording the reactions and stuff. People are going nuts. It's almost like some of your team just won the Super Bowl or won the national championship. The way people are are reacting to it. I thought it was thought it was really incredible. Uh, one of the best episodes and and definitely lived up to the hype for me. Um, but I want to go back to the, to the women in this. I have a daughter, and she's too young to watch this at six. But, I mean, think about the female characters. First, Arya, who's just, you know, you've got this warrior, you know, stealthy. Um, you've got San, even Sansa, who's, uh, you know, maybe a little more feminine and stuff. But that's still a very strong female character. You can be feminine and, uh, and still be a strong character. Very intelligent. Um, of course, Danny. I mean, uh, leading the whole thing, the mother of dragons, that goes without saying, just a tremendous character there. Uh, Cersei is stone cold evil, but again, the queen, the ruler, um, you know, she's definitely been met with a lot of uh, trials and tribulation in her life too, even though she's on the wrong side. And then even Melisandre, the red woman, I mean, everything that she did in the series. So uh, a lot of strong female characters in this show. And nobody even brings it up. I don't mean to get political, but nobody even has to talk about it just because it's it's there. Um, all right. So Game of Thrones, pretty great episode, I thought. All right, guys. Let's see what else we got. We're not going to go too much longer here. We've gone about 27 minutes. Uh, who from Arkansas got drafted, says Dylan Horton. I think we answered that. Enjoy your show. Keep up the good work, says Stephen Pipes. Appreciate you, Stephen. Uh, I want to remind everybody again, like, share, follow, comment. Uh, if you like the video, if you're listening on podcast, throw us five stars. Be sure to subscribe to the show if you haven't. That way you get notified every time we we put up a new show. Arya is the princess that was promised. Who will sit on the Iron Throne? Anybody Anybody got an idea? I mean, the whole dynamic between Jon Snow or Aegon Tar- Targaryen, I should say, and uh, being the nephew of uh, Daenerys is certainly certainly interesting. What do you say to the God of death? Not today. Absolutely. The Dothraki charge was the absolute best way to convey the sense of hopelessness to the people watching. I know. I mean, who's braver than the Dothraki? Who rushes in like the Dothraki? And then to see them like retreating, you know, the the handful of them. And then just a wave of the dead. I mean, they were like crawling over each other. It, It really felt hopeless. They did a great job of, even though we knew deep down, I mean, we say we know they may do anything. They've proven that, but uh, deep down, you knew that they were going to defeat him somehow, but they did a great job of just taking that hope away. I mean, uh, building it up and taking it away over and over again. Um, so, Alec Chandler Harrison, the intern, says, I have a theory that during the whole battle, Bran sent those ravens to spy on Cersei. I don't know about that. I don't know why you would jump ahead to that, Alec. Terry says, will Arya move on to the... Will Arya's move work on the mountain? I don't know. That's going to be interesting. I mean, she has not killed a lot of people. Did we go over everybody that's died? She's not killed everybody that was on her list. The mountain's on her list, and there's no reason for her not to kill him. I mean, there's been a lot of redemption for people. Um, but the Night King, who she killed, Melisandre, we talked about. Theon Greyjoy didn't talk about Theon kind of redeeming himself. I don't know that anybody's had it harder than Theon. Nobody has nobody has had it worse, aside from just dying, but nobody who made it to this point had it worse than Theon. I mean, think about what he went through. Um, oh, with the, uh, what's his name? Man, he was awful. I've, I've forgotten his name, but um, Theon had it pretty bad. But to stand there and take out all those guys and then charge to, to what he knew was his death, I thought was, was pretty impressive. Oh, and Liana Mormont. I, I mean, talking about powerful women, this little girl is like 10 years old and uh, is the uh, – I hated to see her die, but the way she took out that giant was pretty awesome. I thought it was interesting in the in the discussion afterward. He, she was just really supposed to have one scene, but they liked the, they liked her so much that they had kind of expanded her role. Uh, Jorah Mormont, who um, – this was the best take I heard, you know, the guy in the friend circle dying in the friend circle and he even kind of gets a side hug. 
<laughs> so, but Jorah, um, you know, dying the way that I think he would have wanted to die, protecting Danny, um, who he obviously knew he loved. Beric Dondarrion, who was also on um, on Arya's list, but uh, but didn't didn't end up being killed by Arya, and, and I guess ended up being a friend. Uh, Dolores Ed, who was uh, commander of the Night Watch for a while. Viserion, the dragon, um, who finally died officially after being brought back, and vir- virtually every single Dothrakian and Unsullied. So um, that's who's left. Next episode should be pretty interesting. I mean, next episode is probably going to be a bit of a, a takedown. Let's, you know, let's calm it down a little bit. Let's get everybody regathered. Who else do they have to fight with? They have two dragons left, although, you know, they're, the dragons are, you know, not 100%, I wouldn't imagine, but... Um, there's still a lot to go. And I, I like that they went ahead and took care of that side of the episode, went ahead and took care of uh, the Night King and left this part. Some people say they wanted it the other way, but, I mean, really the battle is Cersei. I mean, Cersei's the guy that everybody, the lady that everybody hates and wants to see go down, which makes me a little worried for Game of Thrones because, you know, they don't always do what you want them to do, although I think they really did that this last episode. So, uh, going about 31 minutes here. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. I want to thank everybody for watching. Hope you enjoyed the Game of Thrones talk, um, even though it's a little bit different than than what we did, uh, than what we normally do. So, um, anyway, uh, be sure to like, share, comment, follow, and uh, we'll be back with you guys. Probably do something again later in the week. This has been Trey Biddy with Hogsports.com. We'll catch you next time.